so I'm just starting the recording now. Um, and uh, I want to thank you all, welcome you all for um, joining us for this process. We're really excited about um, working with folks from the community and working on our climate action adaptation um, and resiliency plan. Uh, first off, I want to say that I'm Stephanie Ciccarello, the sustainability coordinator for the town, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. So what we'd like is the first time that you speak today, if you could introduce yourself and then say your pronouns, we'd appreciate that. And then you can remark or ask a question or engage in any way. Um, so. Um, if uh, another thing we wanted to say is that if for some reason, if something happens where the meeting is hacked or Zoom bombed, um, please feel free to jump off immediately. Um, and that's as if anyone displays any inappropriate material or says anything really offensive, feel free to um, immediately disconnect and then we'll reach out to you um, afterwards. So another housekeeping tip is just to remind you that if you are not speaking, please be sure to mute your microphone because a lot of times we'll get background information, uh, background noise, and it really can be very distracting to people. It may not sound loud to you, but to everyone else, sometimes it's really amplified. So please turn off your microphones. And if for any reason during this meeting, you have any kind of video difficulties, feel free to turn your video off. Um, We'd love to see people as much as possible during this session, but if for some reason you need to, um, because you're having some kind of unstable connection, feel free to turn your video off. So um, I just want to very quickly say that uh, this process that we're doing this time, creating this climate action plan is very, very, very different from the one that we did in 2005 when the town had its first developed its first climate action plan. There was a very small group of individuals who worked on that and um, did a wonderful job for the group that we had. But in retrospect now and many, you know, um, almost two decades later, you know, it's really great to actually have a process that is going to be incredibly much more inclusive of a lot of people within the community as it should be. So we thank you for taking the time to be part of this process. So I'm going to launch our meeting with um, a land acknowledgement um, of the indigenous folks um, who we are, we look to, um, who actually were here before us and had this land before us. So I'd like to make this statement of the indigenous heritage of the land. We humbly acknowledge that we stand on Nonatuck land Acknowledging also our neighboring indigenous nations, the Nipmuc and the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohegan and the Pequot to the south, the Mohican to the west, and the Abenaki to the north. And with that, I would like to turn the meeting over. Thanks, Stephanie. I'm Gazit Chaya. My pronouns are they, them. Um, and I'm going to offer uh, some group agreements that we can use uh, today um, just in thinking about how we can be most respectful of one another. So I'm going to introduce some possible agreements um, as a starting point and then through the course of this meeting and the next couple of meetings that we have together and as we get to know each other better, we may find ones that we want to add um, or change. Uh, but this is just a starting point for us to be thinking about today. The first one is um, to really think about putting people and uh, relationships first. So thinking um, in every uh, step of the way today about how these if issues um, affect real people and um, real uh, aspects of our lives. Um, and think about building an understanding um, in places where you disagree rather than trying to win or make your own point or get your individual goals met. Um, the second one is to really pay attention to the language that you choose. Um, we're gonna be uh, having translation today, um, thanks to Rosana in Spanish. And um, she is going to be uh, translating uh, as we 
stop and start. So I'm not modeling that right now because she doesn't need to translate in this moment. Um, but when another member joins us, she'll be doing that translation. And so we'll want to pause uh, after each full thought and let her finish uh, translating before we move on. Um, and I also want us to be thinking about uh, avoiding jargon or technical terms. Um, we don't all come to this meeting with the same level um, of experience with these uh, topics. And so to really um, think about using uh, common terminology. The third one is to step up and step back. Uh, there's always in a group people who tend to be uh, more quiet and people who tend to talk a lot. So we're going to encourage each other um, if you're a person who does speak a lot, um, think about sharing less. And if you're a person who doesn't often share, um, think about taking the opportunity to, um, to participate in that way tonight. Um, and we also want to think about allowing for silence, even though it may be awkward at times, um, because in those silent spaces, sometimes those quieter uh, people may take the opportunity to jump in. Um, the next one is keep um, things private and don't pry. We're really gonna um, be working towards being able to share uh, openly about how these issues um, interrelate with our lives. Um, and we wanna make sure to keep what we learn about others, their families, their feelings, and their finances confidential um, and make sure that we don't ask for more personal details. Um, and that we let people share their, um, their needs or their wants without asking them to prove um, or um, show why those are valid. The last one is um, that we are um, hopefully going to be learning about each other's personal and cultural values as we go. And um, values are not the same for everyone. They're often really a reflection of um, people's backgrounds and experiences. So what's good for you might not be good for everyone. Um, one of the ways that we're going to be doing this is by um, whenever, when you, you have the opportunities to speak the first time, to introduce yourself with your pronouns. Um, we want to really encourage everyone to stick to talking just about your own experiences uh, and working hard not to talk about other people's experiences. Um, to commit to considering that your version of what you think is right and wrong in the world um, are likely, like I said, based on your experiences, and they may differ from others in the room. Um, so be open to hearing and learning about other people's values by asking questions and not assuming that everyone um, shares the same values. Um, and that's it for the agreement. Well, I think it's uh, my turn. Um, hello, and my name is Stephen Roof. My pronouns are he, him, his. I am a member of the Energy and Climate Action Committee. I live in South Amherst, and I am a professor at Hampshire College in Environmental Science and Sustainable Technology. Just as a, as a brief reminder, I think many of you know this, but the ECAC, the Energy Climate Action Committee, was created by the Amherst Town Council in February 2019 to guide the town in meeting its climate mitigation and resilience goals. And the job of the ECAC is to recommend ways to reduce our community's carbon emissions and our, improve our ability to live in a warming, changing environment. Adapting living with that changing environment is what we mean by resiliency. ECAC members are committed to following a holistic and intersectional approach to climate action. And in particular, we are working with relevant town, business, and resident groups. We are engaging the public and relevant stakeholders in education, planning, goal setting, uh, development in the development of climate action plans with particular attention to include inclusion of underrepresented groups and environmental justice communities. And I'll pause for interpretation if that's uh, appropriate now. We're okay for right now, but okay. I'll make sure to give a clear heads up when we get to that point. Okay, great, thank you. So the, the goal of the ECAC 
is to reduce townwide greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by 2025, the year 2025, 50% by the year 2030, and 100%, that is to become carbon neutral, no later than the year 2050. This is a very ambitious goal and it will require everyone in town to help. And so what we have some ideas, the committee has some ideas for reducing carbon emissions in town, but we certainly don't have all the answers. We don't know all the challenges that community members face, but we do know that community members have positive visions for the future and creative ideas for reaching these visions. So this is why we are asking the community, mem you community members present today and in other uh, events for your help. So we look forward to hearing from you. And I'll hand it over to Ashwin, a fellow member on the ECAC to introduce himself. Hi everyone, my name is Ashwin Ravi Kumar. I use he, him pronouns and I've been living in the Pioneer Valley for a couple of years. Uh, I teach environmental studies at Amherst College. Um, so the land use uh, group, which is what you all are all, are all here to participate in, uh, focuses on development, agriculture, soil health, and using soils to store carbon, uh, ecosystem health, food sovereignty, and other related issues. Uh, so in short, the purpose of this meeting from the perspective of our committee uh, is to broaden our understanding of conservation to encompass people care and earth care, caring for people and caring for the planet. Um, so remember that the ECAC will make climate action and resiliency recommendations to the town council. Uh, we serve as a conduit. Um, as far as this process goes, we are aiming high uh, and we hope to have much broader participation from all groups in town, knowing that historically, town governance has had a really disproportionate level of participation from uh, wealthier people, homeowners and business owners, white residents, uh, compared to renters, workers, and people of color. Everyone's voice really matters in this process um, and our focus on environmental justice calls for a much broader approach to including people in this process. So active participation and support from the community will be essential to getting town council to accept these recommendations. Uh, our proposals for dealing with climate change, for having a healthy environment are stronger when they reflect the needs of people that live in Amherst. In this meeting today, we would like to discuss and agree on principles to guide our subsequent decision-making process and our goal really is a process that emphasizes self-organization and empowerment. So thank you so much for being here. And I'm excited to see how this progresses. Indeed, fantastic. Uh, hi, I'm Jim, Jim Newman. My pronouns are he, him, and his. Uh, I'm here as a consultant help to the Energy and Climate Action Committee and to the town. Uh, to help organize the process and do some of the running around. Uh, although I must admit, uh, I have a very big team that I get to work with who are all really quite fantastic. Uh, and um, it's great to see, great to see everybody. Uh, we're gonna start this process in sort of grounding, landing in some of our experience of places and especially if we're talking about land use and we're talking about natural systems, uh, we start with a question. And that question is, think of an outdoor place uh, that you like in Amherst uh, and why do you like it? And as you think about that, maybe think about, um, why do you go there? What would make it better? What would make it better to be there? What would make it better to go there? Uh, and uh, how could it help even more than it might now? So think about that for a sec and then share what your thoughts are uh, about a place you really like to go outdoors in Amherst. And don't forget when you speak, unmute yourself and introduce yourself.
I can get us going. It's always hard to be the first one. So I'm Gazit Chaya, use they, them pronouns. And um, I live at the Brook, which is on East Hadley Road. And uh, we have, um, it's called the Brook, I assume, because we have a little like brook that goes behind our complex. And I think it's actually Fort River. Um, it's the one that goes through Groff Park. And um, there's, there's only like a little pathway that connects it to East Hadley Road. So it's not very like used. It's pretty quiet down there. Um, I hope you don't all overtake it and spread the word. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. You can, you can come, but it's pretty, it's like nobody really goes down there. And so I really love, it's up our neighbors. Um, I really love going down there with my eight year old and the other kids. Um, and especially we've been going um, more uh, Marita's giving me a thumbs up because she's my neighbor. Um, but yeah, we've been going down there more since the coronavirus because um, they closed our pool. And it actually, it just feels like a very fancy place, but it's like still something that we, like it's sort of ours too. So that feels really special to me because there's a lot of times where I feel like, you know, all the fancy places are not really accessible, but it's one that feels really beautiful and like separate and it's always like 20 degrees cooler. So I always think about this group and like, oh, the whole climate thing, it's real, like trees actually help. <laughs> um, but yeah, I love that little spot. And I think the only thing that would make it better is if there were no bugs. Marita, if you're talking, you're muted. Yeah, just remind you to unmute yourself. I should, Stephanie, you could probably do it. Hold on. Or Sean, oh, there you go. Wait, am I good now? Yeah, good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> No, but I agree with because like we live in the same neighborhood. We live literally across the street from each other. Um, I think that living in this area, and I feel like people don't know like how it is to live there. And I think that this whole entire group, I love it. And I think that like can everyone hear me? Something's on my screen. You're okay. We can hear you. Okay. <laughs> but I feel like I just see more of a community-based like situation. Like I think that we have like a good situation with like all the vegetables and all that other stuff. But I feel like we need to get the children more involved with um, vegetables and how to grow things. And you know. You know what I mean? Like things like that. Totally. And do you have a different space that you really love in town? Or I do. It? Yeah. So I feel like um, so Mill River is a great space. And then I also I feel like also behind like where we live is a very great space. And I think that getting our community to get get the kids, you know, like behind, um, you know, like behind like um, the boulders and South Point and all that stuff. They try to say it's like the bad part of town, but it's not. And I feel like it's just like a great place and like the kids, like they love it there. They love going down there. They love planting seeds. They love building things. And that's a great place to start. Yeah, for sure. Great point. There's, there's, for those of you who don't know on East Hadley Road, there's five complexes, South Point, Mill Valley, Boulders, um, the Brook and the front one, I don't know what it's officially called, but there, there's a huge community um, and lots of kids. 
and Marita's right, they're, they're really just an awesome group of kids and they could do a lot with land. New Hollister? Yeah, what that's right. Exactly. Yeah, there's like 15 units only. Yeah, but yeah, New Hollister. Thanks, Caitlin. I, I can talk since I unmuted myself. <laughs> Um, so I'm Caitlin. I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, and the first thing that came to mind for me was actually just like biking around South Amherst um, in particular because of all the farmland and the relatively flat areas to bike. Um, but I also really like the Amherst bike path, although I've been staying away from bike paths a little bit more um, lately. Um, but I was thinking it would be awesome if there was like a protected bike lane on some of, some of those roads to bike on. They actually just started a new bike lane. Oh yeah, that's, that's awesome. So I'm I'm happy to to uh, go. Um, my pro, I'm Dave Zomek. I work for the town. Um, my pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I'm very, I feel very fortunate to work in Amherst. Um, uh, I've lived here most of my life. Uh, I love the community. I have a, a, the opportunity to work with Stephanie and, and uh, all of you and wonderful people on boards and committees. Um, my job touches a lot of different areas. Uh, land use is one of them, development, planning. Uh, things of that sort. Um, I love working on projects like bike paths, uh, open space protection, um, a, a whole range of things that uh, we we do every day for the town and and work with with wonderful folks like uh, on this call. Um, I have many favorite places in Amherst. Um, you've, you've already mentioned a couple of them. I love the Fort River. I love I love rivers in general. Um, but uh, Puffer's Pond is one of my favorite places uh, to go in Amherst on a quiet morning. Um, I also watch birds a lot. So that's one of the things that kind of makes my connection to nature um, a little bit different. And that's how I got into uh, the work I do is through, uh, through birds and ornithology. So I'll stop there. Um, can I say something? Please. Go for it, Marita. All right. So um, I think for a lot of, so obviously I'm, I'm a person of color, <laughs> but I think that it, it would be great if we can get more people, children of color to get their uh, fishing license and things like that in this area. It's not that expensive and to get kids to learn how to fish and to learn how to do things in nature around this area i think would be a very good thing i, I, I don't would, know how that would go i don't know how what that would look like but i think that it would be great that's an awesome suggestion Yes, I would totally agree. I, I happen to be a fisher fisherman myself, and I, I love it. And it's a great way to introduce people to nature and young people to nature. Um, and we have great yeah. plans to do it in Amherst. And also, exactly. And the thing is, too, like even in the in the brook too, kind of gazette. Like we we have the brook, you know, right there. They flood the Fort River with trout. They do. And um, it's really easy to get fishing rods um, for children. And I think it'd be one of, a, like a good project to do like initially. Thanks, Marita. Rosanna, do you have Yohani on the phone? Yeah? Okay, so I'm gonna um, have- Yes, um, I could start with me. Um, let me, uh, so let me just make clear to everyone that now we're going to go ahead and pause for translation. Make sure you say like one clear statement and then take a break so that Rosanna can translate. Yeah, but Johanny is not um, right now in 
in in in Zoom. So as soon she is going uh, connect, uh, I will start to, to translate. Yes. Okay. Can she but hear she you? But she with me. But she with me in, in in at the phone right now. Yeah. So we'll wait for you to oh. translate to her on the phone. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, hi, I, I am Rosana Salazar. I, I am living in, in Amherst too. I am a um, graduate student uh, at UMass uh, in environmental conservation. Um, so my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, well, this is very important for me. I am um, doing a research in, in, at the Amazon, um, uh, in the Peruvian Amazon in South America. And I could see how uh, the impact of the climate change in the, commun in the indigenous communities and in the, for in the rainforest, of course. And, and I think this is a great opportunity. This is a great work. Um, uh, I, I, I know um, Stephanie and Gassit uh, from a previous year, year, and they are doing a great, great work. And yeah, I think, I think uh, we need a real compromise with environmental um, issues or environment, environmental conservations, really. Uh, um, and this, this real compromise has to be with people and with our environment, of course. And also I am, I am helping um, uh, Johanny uh, in translation, but also a lot of you uh, are speaking Spanish too. Yes, <laughs> I will help her too, thank you. So, um, Rosana, do you want to go ahead and um, say what you just said to Johanny um, in Spanish? And then when you're done, you can share your favorite spot. And we wanted to offer to everyone that as we pause for uh, Rosana to translate, that it's a good opportunity for you to reflect on what you're hearing think about what you might want to share next. And um, this is actually a really beautiful opportunity for um, us to slow down in a culture that often has us uh, fighting to be the next person or the quickest one to respond. Um, so use this time to reflect if you wanna write down your thoughts or um, something that you might like to share. Um, and here comes Johanna. <laughs> Hola. Welcome, Johanny. Hola, ¿cómo están? Hola, mi nombre es Giovanni, vivo aquí en Ames y o sea, estoy aquí en la reunión porque me interesa saber más sobre el medio ambiente, sobre, sobre la ciudad ambiental. Eh, hola, soy Giovanni, eh, vivo en Ames y estoy aquí porque eh, quisiera saber sobre el medio ambiente eh, más. Es que estás, hablando, estás hablando en español ahorita, entonces sí yeah. puedes decirlo en inglés. Rosana okay. and I work together a lot, so I'm yelling English at her a lot. Just, that seemed alarming to us. Yeah. <laughs> 
Hello, I am Johanny. I, I am living in Amerson. I am here because I am very interested about what is happening in, here with environmental conservation. And I wanted to know more about that. Awesome. And Rosana and Johanny, if you can both share uh, what your favorite outdoor space is in Amherst, what you like about it, and what would make it better. O sea, mi lugar favorito es el parque que hicieron nuevo, el de Grove Park, que se llama el Garden. Sí, eh, porque, o sea, puedo ir con, con los niños, y tienen ya los niños pueden divertirse con algo, aunque todavía no ha abierto la, la pompa de agua, pero por lo menos ya más divertido, sí, ya tienen algo en que entretenerse, o sea, y además es un parque bonito, que podemos ir con los niños y los adultos también. Oh, ok. Eh... Uh, Johanny said that uh, his favorite, her favorite place is the Grove Park, that is the new park. Yeah, and because uh, they can go with, the ch with children and with the family. I love and, that park. Have a good time. Uh, and, and also that uh, uh, they have the new sprinkles that they can use uh, for now. Me <laughs> gusta. Yeah, it's not open yet, but just hoping that that will open soon and that will make it better. And Rosana, ¿tú tienes um, tu um, favorito? Yeah, for me is is the um, yeah, I think the um, uh, the um, the pool is the park, the mill park. Hmm? Uh, the Pulaski, or which one? Uh, the park is in North Amherst here. Mill River, the Mill River. Mill, the Mill River is, mm -hmm. yeah, because it has the pools and we can go with children and have a, a great time next to the river. Yes. Uh, Ashwin, Mark. Oh yeah, now she's done. Yeah, uh, Bernard. Uh, and Steve, uh, yeah, haven't heard from you. And Rosanna, if you want to leave yourself unmuted when you're translating, then we will be very clear when you're done talking. Hi, I'll unmute myself. I'm Bernard Brennan. Um, I'm a environmental scientist, evolutionary biologist by training, uh, turned farmer. Um, I, well, I have various connections with, with some of you, um, and I just learned with Rosanna, I've actually spent some time doing research in the Colombian Amazon, so we'll, we can talk about that later. Um, I'll mention, there's so many nice places, but I'll mention my backyard, which is the, uh, the Amethyst Brook and the head of the Fort River, connected to the Amethyst Brook Conservation Area. Um, I love the edge effects. It brings in so much different biodiversity. You have a field, forest, stream, all together. Uh, certainly in the heat, it's been wonderful to take my family, uh, new puppy, down, down there and play. Um, but it's also connected to our farm CSA, and I've been involved in CSAs for a few decades now, and I find it's really a wonderfully uh, fulfilling way to, to connect with people and the land. Um, if there was something I worry about in, in the Fort River, it's uh, uh, pollution. I, nice things are sort of, I can see the top of our watershed and uh, there's not a lot from here to there, but as a farmer with neighboring farms, I know there are better and worse ways to, to farm with different sorts of runoff. Uh, and I think we can do a lot um, to, to, to improve that and also do a lot of carbon sequestration. Um, I'm gonna pause you there, Bernard. <laughs> and and we'll try to do about half as much as as that in a chunk.
Did you have anything else to add, Bernard? I, I forgot about the translation, so sorry. Um, I speak Spanish myself because I'm married to a, a, a native speaker. Um, maybe I'll just mention other connections that may be relevant to this group. I've been part of uh, board member of the Northeast Organic Farming Association, as well as Green America nationally. Um, and increasingly, I'm, I'm moving from larger units to smaller, more localized units because it's a, maybe it just suits my personality better, but we can, I, I think we can, I, I've moved here to Amherst very intentionally as uh, um, a, a place with a wonderful future in a variety of different uh, economic and environmental um, social futures. Um, and I'll Pause just say, right there. I'll stop. <laughs> okay, sorry. And anyone who speaks Spanish is also welcome to just speak for themselves in Spanish when they finish in English or to begin in Spanish and then follow it with English. I was just gonna say, yeah, please. All right, I, I can go next. Um, so w once again, my name is Ashwin, uh, he, him pronouns, and I live in a Amherst. Um, and I'm on the Energy and Climate Action Committee. And I too really like Amethyst Brook. Um, I find it to be a delightful place to hike. But there's also a number of places in Amherst that I really like that I actually don't know the names of and might even struggle to really describe. <clears throat> um, I kind of know them as that place along the train tracks um, and that trail that I found on my bike that one time. <laughs> um, so there's places that I've that have names that I'm aware of and others that don't. Um, I, ca I can I can do Spanish as well. So <clears throat> este mi nombre es Ashwin. Uh, mis pronombres son uh, él <clears throat> uh, y este vivo en Amherst y soy miembro del Comité de Energía y Acción Climática. Y uno de mis lugares favoritos en Amherst es también como lo de Bernard Amethyst Brook porque me encanta caminar por allí. Uh, me encanta ver pues la gente que, que disfruta del lugar, pero también hay otros sitios que desconozco los nombres. No sé cómo se llaman, no sé exactamente dónde están, pero por casualidad en varias instancias he encontrado estos, uh, estas joyas realmente que tiene, la, tiene el pueblo. Los conozco como el sitio <coughs> al costado del, del tren o el sitio que encontré andando en bici alguna vez y nada más pues uh, ya yeah. ahí lo dejo hi so i understand a lot of what you're saying my name is manita i go by she he she her pronouns um i agree with a lot of what you're just saying and i think that um for a lot of the children and all the youth in Amherst, I f feel like we should do something. I'm from Amherst. I should say that I'm from Amherst. And I'm a person of color from Amherst. I'm African-American, like literally African-American. My dad kid, my mom's American. And I feel like that we should do something where we let you know what is going on as far as like um like nature goes in this area i don't know if anyone agrees with that definitely thank you so much marita i'm just gonna pause so rosana can translate and for this portion we're all just going to be sharing a little bit about spots that we enjoy in Amherst, but we'll definitely get to um, coming up with ideas of how we can uh, work to connect all of us, including the children, um, to the land.
Mark, going to put you on the spot. Sure. No, no problem. Hello, everybody. I'm Mark Walmsley. I work in Amherst at Kestrel Land Trust. Uh, let's see. My pronouns are uh, he, him, his. Uh, let's see. I primarily work to conserve forest land, farmland, and parkland for my job at Kestrel. Uh, and uh, I'm going to cluster with the last couple people. Uh, Amethyst Brook is up there pretty well for me. Uh, not only because Kestrel owns uh, an abutting parcel, which has uh, a bit of a trail loop on it that leads from Amethyst, Amethyst Brook, but uh, you know, it's a beautiful location and it's proven to be a lifeline recently. And, and I'll get into that a little bit. Um, let someone translate. Thanks. We look good. So uh, I'll just continue where I left off. Uh, the park has really been a lifeline for me in these COVID times. Uh, certainly if you have a car, it's so accessible for children. Uh, and when my wife and I are trying to do chores where we don't want to take the entire family into a public place like a store, uh, one of us will split off, drop the person off, and the other one will drive my eight-year-old to Amethyst Brook and, and, and walk around for an hour. Uh, and enjoy uh, being properly socially, socially distanced from people on the trails there. Um, but yeah, it, it's been a real resource and just a wonderful place to go. And uh, thank you again for inviting me to be on this group tonight. And I think I may be one of the last. One uh, sec, Steve, we're just doing a oh. translation. Okay, all set, Steve. Okay, hi again, Steve Roof here, he, him, his, and I live in South Amherst. And I think for my family, one of the favorite places is we can walk just across Southeast Street and down Chapel Road and onto, I think it's part of the KC Trail, but it, it crosses a little creek where my children like to build little structures and then we, we dodge the poison ivy along the next section of trail, but then it drops into a little a sand quarry that's uh, been active for many decades, I think. Um, but we find some very interesting things in the sand quarry. Once we saw uh, snapping turtles hatching and working their way down to a pond, and the pond is our typical destination. And there, as we walk along the edge, um, we often see at least one or two very big snapping turtles just cruising along along the banks, looking up at us as if they expect us to bring food. I'm not sure if they're that smart or not, but we kind of feel like they're our friends and they hear us coming or they're always there waiting for somebody to come. It's a nice place to walk. It's, it's quiet. It's a short walk from the house. So we're, we're very lucky that we can do that. I'll so pause you right there. Did you want to continue? No, that was it. I was just finishing up there. Okay. 
Lovely. Um, so I think we get Lauren gets to share. And did and Stephanie share? Has Stephanie, oh, no, Stephanie. Stephanie. Yeah. Hi. Um, although I don't live in Amherst, I've worked there for over 20 years. So I know it well. I'm probably there, well, until recently, there more than I was in my own home. And I think one of my favorite places is the rail trail through Lawrence Swamp and some of the hiking trails that are off Lawrence Swamp because they go into deeper into wetland areas. And I used to do wetlands work for the town. So those are some of my favorite places to be. Hi everyone, um, my name is Lauren. I use she, her, hers pronouns and I am part of the consultant team working with Jim and uh, Gazikaya. And um, I don't live in Amherst, uh, but I did go to grad school there. Uh, I was a UMass um, grad. And I will say that I didn't get to spend as much time outside as I wish that I had while in grad school. But um, one place that, one outdoor place that I do really love is um, the cemetery downtown where Emily Dickinson is buried because it's a really um, peaceful and tucked away spot right next to downtown. And I helped to paint the, the history mural that is on the wall that you see when you walk by. Fantastic. Um, so uh, I will share very briefly, I'm again, Jim Newman, he, him, his pronouns. Uh, I do not live in Amherst. Uh, I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but I have done quite a lot of, spent quite a lot of time in Amherst. And I think my favorite place is at the Hitchcock Center where I did a lot of work. Uh, the back uh, sort of quiet, cool, courtyard, uh, I just find very relaxing. There's nothing like being there with kids all over. Dave has his hand up. I just wanted to point that out. I'm not sure if he's We go. I think it was an old, it was a question a few minutes ago about whether we should use the formal hand raising or whether when there's pauses, we can just talk. So I just, just a protocol issue or question. So Dave, uh, that's a great question. Um, we can use the hand raising, but we are not looking really at the participant list. You can just wave your hand. We can see all of us. Uh, so that works pretty well. Um, uh, so there are some things that... Rosanna is just going to translate that. Oh, okay, great. Okay. So there's some things that have come up here, which are important. There's a lot of places 
there's your important ideas. So what we'd love to do is to try and bring up those important ideas so that we can think about how do we make plans that respect those important ideas. So I'm going to suggest that there are a couple that have come up. One of them is the important idea about being close to really great outdoor spaces. They're local, they're close, they're personal. I think one of the important ideas was about farms and uh, farms and food and but also uh, the issue of runoff and that farms and food are both beautiful and important and food is extremely important but runoff is an issue those are things we need to think about how do we how do we make that important can you define runoff oh certainly Thank you, Rosanna. Kuzika uh, um, asked me to define runoff, the term runoff. Uh, so runoff means, is a, is a word that describes when rain falls, things wash off the ground and run into rivers and lakes. Uh, and in farms, a lot of times those things carry fertilizer and other material that are polluting, uh, are, are bad for the bodies of water. And I'd like to uh, shout out to uh, Stephanie on this and the importance of wetlands. Stephanie talked about recognizing and walking through wetlands, but all, almost all of us have talked about the importance of rivers and water and wetlands are part of that. So, Guzzi, could I add something? Or are you waiting for the translation? Okay, Dave. So one of the things I, I heard on this call and, and has been a consistent theme in, in my work with the town is um, thanks to many people who came before us, um, we are fortunate to have all these public spaces available uh, that have not been privatized. Uh, uh, conservation lands and parks, mention of Amethyst Brook and Groff Park and Mount Pollux and the list goes on and on. And we have, we have thousands of acres of protected um, land that is really been protected for wildlife, for, for ecology um, and for nature, but also for people. And so- I'm gonna pause you right there.
Okay. And so part of my interest, and I think it was reflected in some of the earlier comments, is how do we how do we make better connections for all the people who live in Amherst or visit Amherst to nature through those lands? And whether it's community gardens, hiking, biking, fishing, bird watching, uh, um, meditation, all of these things. There, there are ways we can, uh, community gardens, we can make more connections. And I think we're not making those connections for all people in Amherst. That's my opinion that I, I just wanted to put out there. Um, but, but, but it's an interest of mine to make those connections. Thanks, Dave. Did you want to add to that? Just one more thing. We do have these, you know, we're fortunate also to have the colleges, the university, nonprofits. The Hitchcock Center has been doing this work for 40 or 40 more or more years. And so we we have a foundation to build on. I, I don't, I, I think there's there's many resources. I, I just don't think they're reaching everybody in the same way. So how do we work together to to make it accessible to more people. And I'll stop there, thanks. So Dave, I think that, and by the way, thank you, Rosanna. Uh, um, I think that brings us to the final point, which is the one that Marita has been making so eloquently uh, about kids and nature and building that bridge uh, sort of across all of the kids uh, in Amherst and around uh, to really build an, a culture and knowledge of nature and, and the value of natural systems. So I, I just wanted yep, to share that Marita, unfortunately, had to leave. Something came up, but I'm definitely going to pass everything on that we talk about. Great. I, she may have left, but her ideas remain. Uh, we'll just let Rosanna translate that. Um, I invite you now to uh, take the ideas that have come and that you think are really important and to bring them up. What is really important about this? How can we think about ways to look at ecosystems and land and what the town does so that it meets the really important goals? What are those important goals? So I've just identified several. I I just want to jump in with what I heard as probably the most important, and I know Dave mentioned it, is accessibility and making sure that, and we, you know, we know because we work in the conservation department that this land is all over town. And so how do we, 
How do we connect people to it? How do we make sure that people are getting to it and can get to it? Um, you know, it's an it's a interesting thing to think about. Why aren't people accessing it more or what are the barriers to that access? I would also add something I saw in the negative space um, that uh, of what David alluded to um, around Amethyst Brook, which is something that several of us mentioned, uh, is that if you have a car, it's really accessible. Um, but the you know converse of that is that if you don't have a car, uh, it and a lot of other places are not accessible. Um, so questions of access and options to get people to outdoor areas, perhaps even related to programming for children and especially children of color um, would be things to explore around increasing and improving access to these areas. Este, acabo de decir que <clears throat> un asunto que estaba un poco en el espacio negativo, en, en el vacío, <clears throat> um, uh, que me ocurrió cuando dijo David que si tienes un carro es bastante accesible a Amethyst Brook y otros sitios, el, este converso es que si no tienes carros, si no tienes uh, movilidad, es complicado acceder a este sitio de Amethyst Brook, Brook y también a otros sitios, um, otras áreas naturales en Amherst. Entonces sería interesante pensar en cómo podríamos, como una municipalidad, crear programas de acceso, tanto por este uh, tránsito público como en coordinación con programas quizás para los jóvenes, especialmente los jóvenes de color, comunidades de color, como mencionó Marita, para este, superar esta barrera. To build off of that, Ashwin, which I think is a great point. Um, I know that, you know, we've talked a lot about the East Hadley Road um, sort of area of many housing complexes. And I think rates of no vehicle ownership in that area are about 26%, which is really high. And all of those complexes are privately owned and are very restrictive, some more than others, um, in terms of what they will allow to happen at their complexes and on that land, which they claim is primarily because of liability which is maybe up for debate. Caitlin, um, are you thinking about something as specific like growing food or something like that? Uh, that would be a, a, th a thing to say. Growing food and distributing food um, between our mobile market and the Amherst Survival Center, the issue of even be able, being able to get onto that property to distribute food has come up a lot and we have faced a lot of barriers. Great. I'm just wanting to invite Rosanna or Johanny who are so busily um, doing the interpretation. If there's something that you wanted to share you know, regarding what Caitlin shared or regarding other values that you've heard as we've been sharing.
Um, uh, yeah, well, uh, Kaylin, uh, Kaylin, uh, talked to, to that, that, that is an issue for, I think for a long time <laughs> that we want to do a lot of things with those communities. And there are a lot of obstacles, uh, to do this. We want to, to do the community gardens and we can. <laughs> yes, um, we are. Um, uh, we want access to more, um, more help uh, to have access for more help for the residents. But it's difficult, very difficult at this time. And also, um, uh, yeah, with the survival center too. So there are a lot of frustrations. Uh, um, for this is a lot of frustrations for residents that live there. Uh, that they can uh, have access to a lot of uh, uh, services, or in this case, food, that they can go outside and uh, because they, they are, the, the restrictions with, with transportation and the issues because the pandemic. So this is uh, uh, very frustrated and is um, that we are trying to 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 work anyway in in any way <laughs> we are doing things but it will be very good if all the the residents or all the the uh, the people uh, could help um uh, with with this with this these things uh, like i don't know talking with the owners <laughs> owners i don't know what could be <laughs> yeah Mark, I bet you have some thoughts about what's important relative to this topic. <clears throat> Many, I, I, I've mostly been listening and I've been learning a lot. Um, a lot of folks from communities that I don't often get to hear from. Uh, so, so I'm being humble and, and taking as much in and I, I think it will help me. Uh, one, one thing that I will say, which I'm finding interesting, and I'm kind of teasing out a bit here, is the idea of access to natural resources in terms of getting to a place versus having access to natural resources where you are as a community, and particularly related to communities who may be disadvantaged, who <gasps> not be enjoying the full benefits of the local you know, array of natural resources. So I'll pause there to let Rosanna. And is it okay if I jump in there, Cozy or, or Jim? Uh, yeah, it sounds like, Mark, are you finished or did you want to continue? Okay. I'll let Dave add to it. I'm sure you can expand upon that quite a bit. I will 
admit it's sometimes hard for me to hold back a little bit because there's so many projects that we envision for the town that I think um, address some of the, the conversation and some of the uh, challenges that have been articulated here. But just two very quick examples in the area that we've been talking about near East Hadley Road. Um, number one is um, I have in, in my mind that we would eventually make a bridge over the Fort River to connect the residents of the five complexes that Guzzi mentioned earlier to conservation land and eventually um, that would get everyone at walking distance and a connection to Crocker Farm School and the playgrounds there. So that's one idea. Yeah, Maybe. pause, pause right there. there. Johanny is as excited as I am about that idea. <laughs> and, and a much larger project, which is actually farther along than a bridge, is the purchase of the um, Hickory Ridge Golf Course to the south of, of East Hadley Road. So the town is moving forward with that, and, and there's still some uncertainty, but we are proceeding. So if that were to happen, there would be a, a community-based master planning process to envision what could happen on that land in addition to solar power. Solar, solar, uh, a solar field will be part of that. There could be lots of things, community gardens, trails, et cetera. So I'll stop. Awesome, there. yeah, pause right there. Before um, Bernard, I give you a chance to um, share more. I just wanted to say to Dave that when you get to that point of having uh, talking about that golf course, uh, we have a very strong group of 15 community leaders who are working on this project who would be so excited um, about sharing lots of ideas with you. Most of us live right here and have tons of ideas um, and opinions about how that land could really support our community. We're, can I just say, we're counting on you all. So, thank you. Hi, so I, I wanted to introduce- One sec. Well, hold on just a sec. She's not on the same screen. <laughs> I'd just like to say everybody's doing really beautifully. Thank you. Bernard. I, I wanted to advocate for another idea, which is maybe less uh, goal oriented as rather mechanism. And that's advocating for the, let me say, the judicious use of incentives and disincentives to achieve our goals like carbon uh, neutrality. And I'll give just one of many possible examples. Direct payment to farmers for net carbon sequestered, much like SREX are done for solar. And that can be extended to conservation. No, I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you. 
I really appreciated that comment, Bernard, because um, that goes back to something else that I was thinking earlier around how so much of how we interact with the land um, relates to ownership of the land and how our rights really interact with ownership, as Caitlin mentioned. Um, those of us who live in complexes with property managers have a lot less choice. Um, and I would love to see something similar around incentives or disincentives, like holding the, uh, giving people reasons to make things more accessible or better for the earth and the people. Could I briefly expand on, on yours? Please. Um, in addition to financial incentives, direct or not, um, one could have liability waivers. I've spent time in England where the default is yes, you can walk on the perimeter of any farmer's land because they have removed those liability issues. That'd be lovely to have here too. Bernard, I'd just like to chime in myself um, <clears throat> that that thought about both liability waivers and incentives and disincentives, I think can apply across the board, kind of like because Kai was talking, that there's a principle here of encouraging through a number of means the things that we want to have happen and discouraging the things we don't want to have happen. Zoning does that, but we can add accessibility, carbon management, uh, and maybe protection of wetland to those in a very real way. I just want to acknowledge that I see that Marita is back with us and also that we haven't heard from Johanny in a little while. So if there's something either of you would like to share, please feel free. Yohani, if you want to unmute yourself, you can. Okay. Okay, está. Eh, para mí sería algo grandioso de que se diera ese proyecto, porque está, eh, yo vine aquí hace, yo tengo aquí casi cinco años, y cuando yo vine aquí el primer año, eh, la comunidad yo la veía hasta más pequeña, porque eran muchos nada más estudiantes. Ahora vemos muchas familias. Ahora, ahora ha crecido la familia. Por, por ejemplo, aquí en South Port, En casi todas las comunidades son familias con de dos, tres, cinco niños, seis niños. O sea, la población ha crecido más y somos, somos más familia. O sea, ahora viven más familia que estudiantes. Entonces, eso sería grandioso porque ahí se, se podría hacer de todo. Como empezando, por ejemplo, con el mismo carro móvil que podríamos atribuir a más personas. Más personas lo pueden conocer. 
actividades de temporada para los niños y para los adultos también, promocionar, por ejemplo, lo, lo que son los vegetales, la naturaleza, la tierra, que, que muchísimas cosas, un, esa, eh, podemos hacer varias cosas, las actividades del pueblo, por ejemplo, para que la persona la conozca más, porque, por ejemplo, eh, esta reunión que tengamos aquí ahora, yo, a lo primero, yo no sabía que existía una comunidad del pueblo, ni, ni, que, ese, ni que tampoco era, por ejemplo, la, las reuniones de clima, o sea, yo, yo no ignoraba todo eso, entonces, ahora yo lo conozco, pero hay muchas personas que no lo saben, y que no sabe que esto existe, o sea, por, por la comunicación, o sea, porque, el, por ejemplo, aquí no hay eh, centro grande como donde se pueden juntar más personas, la, una comunidad más grande, y un proyecto así pudiera esa, regarse mala voz, porque todos asistirían ahí, o sea, a un local grande, y se comunicaría más, y la gente se enteraría mucho, mucho más de todo lo que se puede hacer aquí, y todo lo que tiene el pueblo. Yeah, Johanny, Johanny said that um, um, uh, well, this is this is great that we 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 are here and we we could talk about all these things. Um, uh, she she came uh, here. She, she she's here for five years, and the community was more uh, small, smaller than than now. Now there are more families. There are families that have two, three, five children, and is um, um, so. Uh, she said that that there are more families than before. There are more families than than students. She said, <laughs> but um, so other thing is that uh, through the mobile market, uh, she believes that that is a great opportunity to have more activities around and promote um, uh, promote uh, um, uh, to take care of the land or things uh, around that and, and have more activities have more activities uh, from the town that also is important uh, um, she uh, at first at first she uh, she didn't know much a lot uh, about um, the climate climate um, meetings, but now she knows about this, but there are a lot of people that don't know. So she believes that the communication could be very important uh, to spread the word uh, to, uh, so a lot of people could um, um, embrace this, this, uh, this project too. Thank you so much, Rosana. I think that, uh, Johanny, you uh, identified something and, and we've all talked about the aspect that if people don't know about what's available or if they don't know how to get involved, then their voices will be absent. Um, and that's something that Stephanie has continued to hear and um, know about this through this process is that communication is so big. I see you, Mark, and I think that maybe Marita had something to share, so I'm going to oh, just sure. make yeah. sure. You have to just unmute yourself, Marita. This is probably tricky on our phone. No, it's, it's OK. Yeah, you Mark is good. OK, just jump in if you have something. Okay. Mark, you can go ahead. I unmute myself here. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of comments that Jim, uh, Bernard, and, and Dave had made uh, talking about incentives and disincentives. Um, I, I would hope that that level of thoughtfulness and creativity 
is also applied to issues of siting of renewable energy as we try and reach our carbon goals. Mark, could you, oh, sorry, could you just um, say briefly what siting of, um, I forgot the next part, siting of renewable, renewable, renewable something? Energy. Same well, question. Thanks, Debbie. Sure. Certainly, renewable energy, be it solar, wind, mostly solar we're talking about here, is going to be very important uh, in meeting all of our carbon reduction goals. Um, so there'll be a lot of pressure. Uh, I always wanted to just remind people to be cognizant or conscious of not harming things that you're trying to protect from climate change by where you put solar panels, but also encouraging them as much as you can in creative ways, large scale solar uh, installations, um, encouraging community investment in renewable energy uh, and solar developments, I think is also wonderful, but just again, it's very complex, but being thoughtful, I think is important. So it, Stephanie, I see you. I just wanted to clarify once more. Um, it sounds like it's one of those areas where there's a conflicting goal or value. I've heard other people talk about like you need the solar, but you want to not uh, do more harm to the land by where you put the solar. Is that what you meant? Absolutely, particularly when it comes to farmland, forests. These are things that we're trying to protect from climate change uh, with increasing solar, with solar and renewable energy development. Why threaten the things you're trying to protect? <laughs> uh, because we need them all for our well being going into the future. Okay. But you have it exactly right, Casa Chai. Stephanie? So I was going to actually give a clear example of what Mark was saying, which was specifically about farmland, that the utility companies, large developers often will purchase farmland because it's already flat for the most part, and it's easy to put and install solar on farmland. So that was, I just wanted to have a very clear example of what we mean by when you have a conflict of the, the two different needs.
agree to anything you want to say? No? Yeah. Not yet. I'm gathering my thoughts. No pressure. Sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, other thoughts about what are important. These are, we've identified many important qualities that we think are, are valuable. Other thoughts? So we've got Bernard and then Steve. Um, um, I guess I'll just want to reflect a little gratitude maybe. I've, I've heard of interest in access to land and food and come through in several positive comments about the new mobile market. Um, we've been talking about it for years and most of the veggies are coming off of our farm here. Um, incentives and community uh, have made it a reality. So on the one hand, we're doing a, more than we ever have, which is awesome, but I see so much room for expansion um, and incentives would help. <laughs> but yay, mobile market. Let's do more of it. I see you, Marita. One second. Okay. <laughs> uh, Steve was going to share next, but Steve, are you all right if Marita jumps in and then you can follow? Okay, go ahead, Marita. Um, so, as I said before, like I live in the park and I am, you know, I benefit from. You're breaking up a little bit, Marita. Sometimes if you take the video off, the, the sound may come through better. Okay, hopefully we'll get her back. Steve, if you want to share. Yes. Um, there's so many things that we've expressed that we like about areas in Amherst, the natural spaces, the recreation spaces, the farmland that provides us food. Um, we have to be care careful and very active in trying to defend those places or, or prepare ourselves for vast changes, climate changes, weather changes that are going to threaten those lands and those features as they are now. So climate is going to change. We've warmed up almost a degree Fahrenheit. It's likely to warm up another degree Fahrenheit in our lifetime in a decade or two. And weather patterns are changing with precipitation. So there's going to be tremendous pressure on those resources for change. And we're going to have to live with some of those changes but we're also gonna to have to do our part to help reduce those changes by reducing our carbon emissions. So I think- Okay, that... one second. Go for it, Steve. I think just to conclude, we, we're gonna have to brace for 
changes to those areas and do our best to help reduce those changes by controlling our carbon emissions in our community, in our country, and across the world as well. Jim, quick check to you that uh, nine minutes left. Time check. In this little space, I just wanted to thank Lauren, who's been taking notes this whole time and uh, make sure that everyone knows that everything that's been shared here is something that we're going to have um, kept track of and uh, that this is going to help us to continue into the next meeting. So um, thank you, Lauren, for taking notes and um, everyone know that this is not just going into the wind. Not at all. Very welcome. Fabulous. So we've heard about uh, the importance of accessibility and that thought about conservation and conservation areas where you live versus conservation areas where you have to go. That's really important. We've also heard, ah, Marita's back. Awesome. Uh, um, we've also heard uh, about the idea of incentivizing the things we want to have happen and disincentivizing the things we don't want to have happen. Marita, you want to try again? You might turn off your video. Yeah, hold on a second. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, yeah, my phone died for a second there. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to remember what I was responding to. While you're thinking, and you can jump in, mm -hmm. I'd like to say that there are plenty of opportunities to say more. Uh, you can talk to one of us. You can talk to your committee co-chairs, Steve and Ashwin. You can talk to Kazi Kaya. You can talk to Stephanie. Absolutely more information, more thoughts. Okay. So okay, Marita, I'm just going to let Rosanna translate what Jim said. Hold on to your thought. Yep. Okay, go for it. Sorry, I like my phone died when I was trying to respond to what you were talking about. So. <laughs> totally, it happens to all of us. Um, wait, so what was the original question? Or the original thought? So we were talking about values and uh, important aspects that are coming up for us when we think about the land and how we're connecting with it or not able to connect with it in Amherst. Yeah, so I think for me, since I, I don't know, since I grew up here um, and being literally African-American because my dad's African and my mom's American <laughs> and we have all this Native American background with us too, um, 
Uh, I think that Amherst, first of all, I don't like it being called Amherst in the first place, but I think that the, what we're doing with the food resources, it's like my mom always says, oh, you want to be poor, be poor in Amherst. <laughs> because of like the resources that we have here. However, I think that I have a younger brother who's obviously black. <laughs> and I think that for him and like the things that he's experienced and things that my other relatives have experienced for black males, they don't get the same resources, the same, um, how do I say it? They don't get the same I don't know how to say it. They don't get the same respect as we have as females or as people of, or as white people. And I know that my brother, he even said that he went to a protest. He went to the same process, protest I went to in Northampton. And he's like, I'm never going to a protest ever again in Northampton or in Amherst. Because he said that he, tried to just literally just take a seat in someone's yard and they completely denied him and as someone that was at the protests like a white person at the protest and said i don't want you on my yard and there's a lot of people of color in amherst and in Northampton areas who are like that. And so it's like, when we get resources from people, it's like, it's a grain of salt. And it's like, is it coming from a place of faith? It's coming from a place of, you know, they really want to help. But I feel like a lot of times too, it's like a lot of people of color who are, who are friends of mine, they don't want to take anything because of that. Because it's hurtful. But I don't know. I don't, I don't, I literally have no idea how to like bridge that gap. So I don't know if you guys know how to do that because like we really, we want to bridge that gap. But I just, I don't, we don't know how to do it. I'm so right there with you. I'm gonna just have Rosanna translate that from, for Yohani. And I'd like to respond, Ezekiah. Like it's not easy to pretend like you're from the happy valley and it's not really happy for a lot of us. Especially if you're a queer person of color.
Rosanna is just still translating. Rita, you said so much important. Yeah, sorry. No, it's all good. Rosa and I want to make sure also that you heard uh, the last part where Marito was saying that it's not a happy valley for all of us, especially for queer people of color. So I know that we're right at 801. I wanted to ask if everyone's willing to spend a few extra minutes together and know that if you need to um, head out, then we totally respect that. Marita, was there anything else you wanted to share? Um, no, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Stephanie? Um, I just first want to thank you, Marita, um, for sharing that. And also to say that a lot of this, when we talk about communication and how important communication is, part of communication is listening and hearing. Mm -hmm. It's not just talking. And so when we say that communication came out as a priority, I would say your sharing and people hearing and listening is a big piece of this. Oh, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. We appreciate you and that, your words. A lot of times people say, they're like, you know, take the cotton out of your ears and put it in your mouth. <laughs> and that goes for any, you know, any group that needs to be heard. But who else is out there? No one's else talking. <laughs> that was so um, just important for us all to have the chance to share. And I'm so grateful that Marita was able to come back in because um, I think we, we all heard really valuable things, um, especially from uh, Rosanna and Johanny and Marita, our community leaders. I just wanna um, really acknowledge uh, their part in this and um, and especially to Rosanna for all the translation. So I'd just like to also just thank everybody for being here and to say that we will have be scheduling another meeting and providing all of the notes from this to everyone. And uh, again, get a hold of anyone if you have more thoughts you want to talk before we get to the next meeting. Kuzikai, what do you think about uh, the homework question? 
Uh, I think it would be great to just, if Ashwin and Steve feel like they can give it very briefly, I think we could close out with um, a send off of something we would love for you each to think about as we transition towards the next meeting. Sure. Oh, sorry. I can, I can take it, Steve, if that's okay with you, cool. So we would like to, um, well, again, just to reiterate, thank you all so much for your participation, um, especially to the community leaders and to Rosanna for the translation. Um, this has been hugely helpful from the perspective of the committee in terms of how we think about issues around land use, issues around access to natural areas, the connection between all of that and climate change and how we can make these processes heal some of the harm that undergirds so much of these, so many of these issues in our town. Um, so really, really appreciate it. Uh, we, we'd like to give you um, the opportunity going forward, um, if you're up for it, uh, to kick a little bit of information back to us um, and to take this conversation out into your community. So if you could ask two or three neighbors or friends something related to these questions around land use. We're curious to know, for example, where do your friends and neighbors get their vegetables? Um, are people able to grow food where you live? Um, if there's any other aspect of this conversation um, around how people feel around accessing natural areas, for example, ask a neighbor or ask a friend about that and let us know what they say. Um, we'd love to hear it. I'm just gonna do that in Spanish now. Bueno, primera, primero, muchas gracias para, bueno, para toda la participación y especialmente a, a los líderes, las líderes, lideresas comunitarias que se han juntado a esta reunión. Ha sido realmente súper incalculablemente útil para nosotros como el Comité de Energía y uh, Acción Climática. Um, Y bueno, todos los aportes que ustedes han dado nos ayuda un montón para seguir adelante y pensar en los asuntos sobre el uso de tierra, el uso de suelo, la conexión entre tanto y el asunto de cambio climático y cómo todo eso se relaciona con el daño que está al fondo en nuestro país y nuestra comunidad. En los asuntos de acceso diferenciales, desiguales, a los áreas naturales que tenemos, pues, en cuanto a eso, mucho que pensar y mucho que hacer, realmente. Entonces, gracias por eso. Queremos despedirles con una oportunidad de seguir adelante con esta conversación con tus amigos, con tus vecinos. Uh, y si tienes tiempo y si te, si te interesa, uh, involucrarles a más gente, más allá de este grupo en esta conversación que para nosotros es súper importante. Y si quieres, podrías preguntarle a un vecino, una vecina, un amigo o amiga, un miembro de la familia, sobre dónde, uh, de dónde saca, de dónde compran o acceden sus vegetales, sus legumbres, ¿no? Para comer, para sus comestibles. Si es posible, es de sembrar, uh, hacer, bueno, sembrar un este vivero, tener un jardín donde viven, o si es, es más difícil y por qué. Nos encantaría saber sobre este asunto. Uh, y también si hay otro asunto que ha surgido a través de esta discusión, sería interesante también preguntarles a alguien más sobre pues, qué les parece, cuál es su perspectiva. Uh, si es que ellos tienen algún, alguna opinión o alguna experiencia con las áreas naturales, si hay alguna experiencia positiva o alguna barrera también para acceder a estas áreas, nos encantaría saber de eso, porque toda esa información nos ayuda un montón para preparar el plan y al final de cuentas implementarlo para lograr las metas de este proceso. Creo que lo voy a dejar allí. I think I can leave it there. Um, thank you all can so I much. Say, can I say one more thing? Um, if you guys live in South Amherst, um, so one of the things that we're trying to do is to get vegetables grown in our gardens so that our community can you know have access to fresh vegetables 
So like we, me and, and Gazit and some other neighbors have been growing fresh vegetables so we can like, you know, get our community to figure out how to actually grow fresh vegetables, but actually have access to it. And we're growing it so we can give it away to people. And so if people, if you know people that live in our neighborhood or know kids that want to learn how to grow vegetables in our neighborhood in South Amherst, please let us know. And any and anyone else, really. Because like I started growing tomatoes for the first time. <laughs> and I started growing cucumbers and zucchini. And it's very, very easy. So like we're trying to get kids to like let them know how to grow vegetables and let them know how to be self-sustainable. Yeah, so. Thanks, Marita. We'll let Rosanna translate that real quick. Okay, sorry, that was a lot. <laughs> good. All good. Basically, come to my backyard. We should probably make our way. So thank you so much for everybody. We'll see you soon. Great to see all of you and meet some of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure meeting you all. Thank you, everyone.